D'Hollywood à Broadway, de Broadway à Hollywood, voici Kazan, 80 ans et toutes ses dents géants pour une vie, le livre où il raconte la sienne. Tell me, did you write a life to justify yourself? <rires> proud of my life and all the things I did and I, I didn't write it for that reason. I wrote it to look at my life again. At the end of your life you sometimes dream back and ask yourself about what you did and how you saw it. But you know when you tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing else but the truth, as you say you did, aren't you bound to hurt some people? You, you do hurt people. Uh, for the first time uh, in my life I said what I thought about a number of people and they were a little upset. I wouldn't say they were mortally hurt. I mean, they'll recover, but at least they know what I think and I go to the grave with having said everything I feel. Tell me, did the uh, actors wait for the actor's studio to tell them what their link of a part was to their own lives? I was an actor for eight years and I learned very quickly uh, that the best way to understand something in a scene is by understanding uh, something similar that happened to yourself. Tell me, is there a method to discover why Brando, Dean, Montgomery, Clift, and Warren Beatty became stars? No, I was very surprised with everyone except uh, Brando. I knew Brando would be a star. I did not expect uh, Jimmy Dean to be a star, but he was full of talent. He had enormous talent, but I didn't expect to be a star. Warren Beatty, when I started, he was just a kid. Uh, I knew Cliff very well because Cliff uh, had a mother fixation on my wife. He used to sit at her feet and, uh, and look up at her and ask her advice and so forth. And I knew how sensitive he was. But there's an element that escapes me in all these men, which is I do not understand why women find certain men's appearance attractive. I don't know. I'm not sure it is appearance. Perhaps it is something, uh, a power in them. I think women are attracted basically to power, not looks, not appearance. It may be money power, maybe sex power, maybe physical power. I think that's what attracts women. But uh, uh, the, uh, I didn't feel it in these men because uh, I'm, I'm not attracted to that particularly. How do you uh, explain how Jimmy Dean, who is such a brat, became such a great star? It puzzles me. The reason is that he, uh, at that time, young people, young men particularly, were uh, very restless with their father's authority and with the, uh, with the system. And uh, Jimmy Dean was the embodiment of adolescent rebellion. But I don't think much of adolescent rebellion. I'm not impressed with it. I like rebellion later in life where it has a real purpose. And Jimmy, uh, Jimmy was just the bad boy around the block, and the young people reacted to it. Especially inhibited women, they reacted to it. They felt, uh, my God, uh, uh, that's me. What do you think it was that made Orson Welles and Marlon Brando get so gross, so fat? I've asked myself that question many times. I asked Tennessee Williams that question once. He said a terrible thing, which I never forgot. He said self-disgust or anger at themselves and then they get no pleasure out of life anymore and the only pleasure they get finally is by stuffing themselves and eating and so on. You said in the book that a year after your testimony before the House and American Activities Committee you stopped feeling guilty. You've even said that you stopped feeling guilty months, only a few months afterwards. Is that true? No, about, about two months afterwards when uh, I lost a few friends. Uh, I lost a few friends that I don't, I don't feel they're deprived of. Uh, they forgot, I forgot it. And I stopped feeling guilty. You can't live a life on guilt. And when I thought about it, I thought I did right. Although it was difficult. It was not a simple choice. Sometimes you say either this or that, and one is black and one is white. It wasn't anything like that. Is it possible that because you were the son of a rug dealer, a rug merchant, you had some need to exert revenge on the white Anglo-Saxon population in the school and in the society where you moved? I felt that I was uh, uh, looked down on a little bit. I, see, when I was in college, I was a waiter. Uh, four years I waited on table and I brought food to the privileged. 
to the, those who had money enough to pay their way and so forth. And then I went to drama school and I worked the dishwasher. So all the time I felt that uh, I was one of a, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, outsider. And uh, naturally it's inevitable that there be some feeling of, now I've turned the tables on you, haven't I? Are you still an outsider? Uh, I don't think so, no. What do you say to yourself every morning when you look in the mirror? There's a famous story about a uh, justice of the Supreme Court in America, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and he was 80 years old, like I'm 80 years old, and he was walking down the street one day, and a beautiful girl passed, a young girl with everything perfect in place and so on, and he looked at her and he said to the man that was walking with him, he said, oh, to be 70 again. Sometimes I feel I wish I was 70 again. Do you remember your father saying to you with uh, your face, you would never be an actor? I, he said, what are you going to do at the Yale Drama School? I said, I'm going to study acting. He said, didn't you look in the mirror? You say in the book, a life, that talent like beauty vanishes. Is that true? No, my, that's the best book I wrote. The, the autobiography I wrote is by far the best book I wrote. It's completely truthful, but it came from, uh, it took me four years to write it. I worked every day for four years, and also I was determined to be honest and clear and not, uh, not, uh, not avoid any, any problem. I am very hard on myself. Many people who reviewed my book in America, reviewers, said that uh, I'm harder on myself than any critic ever was, and it's true. Suppose a life, your life, had to be lived again. What would you do differently? I'd start writing earlier.